say start and here we go. All these people I've been trying to reach all day are all calling right now. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it usually goes. All right, just give it another minute or two. Hello, everybody. We still have people joining, so we will start in just about a minute or two, give people a chance to, to connect. All right, so uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, my presentation today. My name is Sasha Tomic. I'm the Associate Dean for Strategy, Innovation, Technology, uh, and also Senior Program Director for Graduate Programs in Analytics at the Woods College of Advancing Studies at Boston College. Essentially, what that means is that I run Master of Science in Applied Economics and Master of Science in Applied Analytics at uh, BC. So today, I want to talk about if you are picking the right educational program, there are all these options that people have. So how to think about uh, these different options and what uh, should you do? What questions should you ask? So we'll talk about the type of the degree. That's the first decision point. Should it be a degree uh, or should it be some kind of four credit certificate? Four credit meaning that you earn academic credit in a traditional sense, you know, classes that show up on some kind of college transcript that essentially can be taken somewhere else or transferred into another institution. Uh, the other option are the not for credit courses, and it can be anything from the university run courses to something like LinkedIn learning and so on, or maybe a boot camp. We have boot camps in data science and data analytics are particularly popular, although they are popping up in, in different fields. Uh, and then, I would, you know, the, the third option would be the MOOCs and these one-off courses, again, either uh, offered by the educational institutions or private providers and, again, different platforms. Once you decide what kind of degree, there is the question of which format uh, do you want to learn in? Do you want to prefer face-to-face -face or hybrid? And then do you also prefer online? Obviously, online post-pandemic is a much more popular option than it was before pandemic, but there are still some questions that you should ask. So the first question, obviously, is what is your objective? And when it comes to this, and when you are thinking of these options and different options within each category, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to enter a field uh, or transition into it? In other words, are you at the beginning of your career and you want to get a better first job? Or are you very well established and you want to understand? And I will talk in the context of analytics and data science. So maybe you're already managing teams and such, but you notice everybody's talking about data. You want to understand that better. So and also, do you want to transition into this field? You are maybe working in something else, let's say communication, but you would want to transition into data analysis, data science. The next question is, are you looking to be a better individual contributor or a better manager? That has a huge implication as to what kind of program uh, you should consider. The other thing is, where are you lacking? Are you lacking technical skills or are you lacking soft skills or both? Finally, what kind of education do you already have? Do you have a bachelor's? Do you have a master's? Or do you have a PhD? And if you have a PhD, again, we come back to the first question. Are you trying to maybe do something else with your PhD than you did before? And then finally, what level of education do you need for what is that you are trying to do? So let's start kind of at the end. So this is the picture for the educational attainment in the United States over the last 20 years. And what you can see, the number of people obtaining all kinds of degrees, uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD has increased considerably, but nowhere has the increase been as dramatic as it is in the master's degrees. Uh, I also want to start with a disclaimer. Uh, yes, I run two master's programs. Yes, we are trying to recruit students. No, this is not the sales pitch. Uh, okay, so this is like anything else. These degrees are to some degree a numbers game. And basically what we can also see is that the number percentage of people with um, bachelor's and master's degrees has steadily grown over not just over the last 20 years, but in general. Again, there has been a lot of activity in the master's field. And that's why what we see with the job ads is that more and more of them are asking uh, either prefer master's or require uh, master's. And in the AI uh, field, which is how, you know, uh, Birch that I'll talk about in just a second is classifying the traditional data science. We are even moving into the PhDs. So if you look at the data science and AI professionals, uh, data scientists are people in this nomenclature, data scientists are people involving in predictive analytics. AI are people that are working in what was traditionally the data science uh, and such. So we can see 
uh, data scientists, majority of them have at least a master's degree for AI professionals. You can see, uh, you know, PhDs are more represented than they are for the, for the data scientists, but the bachelor's is the bare minimum. If you look at the job postings, and this is from Lightcast, uh, you can see for different job categories, you can see different percent of the uh, job ads that are looking for masters plus for statisticians and data scientists majority of the uh, of the job ads are looking for either masters or phd whereas for database analyst and developer and business intelligence architect or developer is the minority but all of them require at least a bachelor's degree so if any of you are attending you don't have a bachelor's degree and you are reading all these news stories about you know is bachelor's really necessary anymore for these type of jobs, we are still not seeing a huge inflow of sub bachelor's uh, qualifications. These are just some salary data for the individual contributor, different levels with the master's and PhD. Uh, they do not report data on bachelor's, but you can see there are considerable returns to both. The difference between master's and PhD is not uh, that significant. This is for data science, and then this is the data for the AI individual. So all this is to motivate, you know, what, what comes next. So what are some of the things to think about? So first of all, which credential do you need? Do you need a degree? Each one of these, and also I wanna be clear, I, my goal here is to have you ask better questions. I don't necessarily have the answers because it all depends on your, on your personal situation. So degrees have, obviously pros and they also have cons. So the pros for the degree, they are generally well-established credentials. I mean, everybody knows what master's is, everybody knows what bachelor's is, everybody knows what PhD is. People are looking at those uh, on your resume and you don't have to do a lot of explaining. Another pro of the degree is that oftentimes you get some broad education. This is absolutely true for bachelors. So when you are getting bachelor's, it's not just the coding that you will learn if you get into some kind of analytic program, but it's everything else, critical thinking, communication, and so on. Master's programs, PhD programs tend to get more specialized, but at the same time, they also will have some of the more broad education. So it's teamwork, again, communication, critical thinking, uh, and so on, in addition, hopefully, to uh, you know, the technical skills. Oftentimes there is the dedicated faculty, either full-time or part-time. And these people oftentimes have been with the program for a long time. So they get to know you, help you build your network and everything else. Uh, there are generally career placement resources, both at the program level and the university level, definitely at the university level, oftentimes at the program level. And then there is the alumni network. And the alumni networks uh, are generally strong. It's just a matter of where. So if it's some kind of, you know, local university, they will probably be strong locally. If it's a brand name institution, they will probably have national and international network and alumni like working with each other. What are the cons? Obviously a lot of cons as well. Uh, degrees can take a long time. Masters can take anywhere from a year to three years. PhD can take four to five to seven to eight years. All right, bachelors also can take anywhere from three to 17 years, depending on what pace uh, do you move. So it can take a long time to complete this, especially if we get to the next point, the cost. The cost, monetary cost can be high. Uh, some degrees are in the multitudes of tens of thousands of dollars. Some are over $100,000, but there are plenty in the sub $50,000 or sub $30,000 range. But there is this non-monetary cost. And non-monetary cost can be huge, especially if you're already working. So for some degrees, it might be impossible. For example, again, PhDs are generally full-time. You have to put your life on hold for four years at least, three to four years. Uh, and some people cannot do that. Uh, same thing, again, if you don't have a bachelor's because you were busy providing for the family, uh, or if the master's is only full-time during the day, you cannot always put your life on hold while you get the degree. Some of the degrees can be too theoretical. Uh, in other words, you know, people are teaching from their area of research and not necessarily worrying about the application as much. And they can be too fast or too slow. Sometimes degrees are accelerated, but that means a lot of work in a short, uh, short period of time. MOOCs are another of massive open online courses. 
Uh, this is, you know, generally your Coursera, edX, and so on. But I would lump into this anything like LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, and so on. So these, uh, you know, very topical. They definitely have pros. They are very topical. They don't bother with, always with larger context. You want to learn basics of Python, they will teach you basics of Python. Okay. Next, you want to learn some SQL, they will teach you some SQL. If you go to LinkedIn Learning, you want to learn how to negotiate with your boss for the raise better, that's what they will teach you. So they are very topical, very much, you know, what you need, when you need it, and very quick, more often than not. They are generally self-paced. So one of the, when I say too fast, too slow for the degrees, you are for better or worse on a semester basis or a quarter basis or whatnot. So usually the course is seven weeks or 14 weeks. You come to class, you can't move faster or slower than the rest of the group. With MOOCs, they're generally self-paced. You, you know, you do it all in one day if you have the capacity or you stretch it out over six months, it's completely up to you. Generally speaking, they are very cheap and oftentimes free, especially if your organization has a subscription. And generally they have timely content. I mean, there are not very many MOOCs, especially not successful ones, where somebody is teaching, you know, the quintessential professor teaching from slides from 20 years ago, right? Usually the content is very, uh, very timely. What are some of the cons? There is no real guidance through the course of the program. More often than not, you are on your own. Yes, there is a community uh, around the MOOC, but you don't really have this relationship with the faculty member and there is not as much support. The recognition of the credential is still evolving. You know, so by just saying, hey, I have the data science certification from Johns Hopkins on Coursera, that is beginning to be more and more recognized, but it's usually not a substitute for what I would call underlying degree, either a bachelor's, master's or, or PhD. So generally speaking, you know, this is still evolving, if you will. There is usually not direct contact with faculty. So this might be a very famous, very accomplished person, but you do not get to interact with them. Uh, and of, more often than not, there is no career support. You know, they don't necessarily have people coaching you through the job search process or, you know, a career center with a list of uh, jobs or networks and so on and so forth. The other option, the third option is the boot camp which is somewhere between, if you will, these two. Uh, generally speaking, boot camps offer faster completion. These are not for credit, more often than not, uh, meaning you know, it's, a, the, it's a credential in and of itself, but does not really translate into anything on the academic side. Uh, oftentimes, these have very strong industry connections, uh, sometimes better than the degrees, sometimes worse. It just depends on, on which one, but they usually have pretty strong uh, industry connections and they are pretty involved with industry more often than not. They are generally less costly than the degree. Uh, it's simply it is, but not always. Some of these can be also in tens of thousands of dollars and they more often than not have practitioner faculty, somebody who is actually practicing what they teach. This doesn't mean that the other uh, types don't have this, especially with the degrees, but with boot camps, that's almost exclusively the case. The cons, uh, the recognition is still evolving. Again, you know, yes, you've completed the boot camp, but again, you, you have a bachelor's plus boot camp. What about somebody that has a higher degree plus, uh, plus boot camp or no boot camp? So the, the, the recognition of the degree is or the credential is still evolving. And it's not necessarily enough without what I would again call underlying degree. So where boot camps work really well, and I just recently had a conversation with somebody that's high up in data science in one of the international companies, and he's a math PhD. And basically we were talking, he said, oh, how I got into data science, I went into a boot camp after I had my PhD in math. And that is the winning, if you will, combination in the sense that there is a degree that's very well recognized in the field that's very well recognized. And then boot camp gives that practitioner uh, appeal to, to the person, all right? Uh, so these are questions that I encouraged you to ask uh, people, but also I just want to say, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and I will take them uh, at the end. So as you are exploring these programs, as you are contacting, being contacted by them and contacting their staff, what are some of the questions that you should ask? So regardless of what the format is of these programs, and by the way, most except for MOOCs, MOOCs are almost exclusively online, 
boot camps and degrees could be online, they could be in person, or they could be a combination of both. So regardless of the format, what are the questions to ask people? Number one, reputation of the institution, okay? It's very nice for me to say that being at Boston College, obviously I'll say that matters a lot, but all of the research shows that that is number one uh, characteristic that employers are looking at. Reputa institutions have reputation, you need to figure out what it is. Is it local? Is it national? Is it international? There are very few institutions that have international reputation. There are more institutions that have national and then plenty of institutions have local uh, reputation. It is not necessarily the more famous is better. It just depends on your objective. Okay, so if you want to be in Southeast, you know, in Georgia, University of Georgia or Georgia Tech, you'll probably have stronger reputation than even Boston College. But if you are in the Northeast, it's completely the other way around. Okay, so what is the reputation of the institution? Second question, are there full-time and part-time options? Sometimes the master's degrees in particular, PhDs in particular, will not have part-time option. So is that possibility for you? For some people it is, for some people it's not. Who is the faculty in the program? That's a big question. Are these research faculty that are maybe you know, working outside or not? Or are they practitioners, uh, people who, who are practitioners? Practitioners could be people who are working in industry and teaching for the program, or it could be full-time faculty who, who are doing a lot of consulting, but you need to understand who the faculty are. Again, you know, it's not that one is better than the other, but it depends what your objective is. If your objective again is to become a researcher, you want research faculty. If your objective is to work in industry, you want somebody who understands how to deal with deadlines and questions that maybe cannot be answered quickly, which in research people don't do. They pick a topic you know, of their interest and they can spend whatever time they want uh, on it. So full-time versus part-time faculty. Again, these are both good and bad, right? So if they have full-time faculty, who are these people? You know, what courses do they teach? How do they contribute to the program? Part-time faculty, the positive of part-time faculty is usually they are the industry practitioners. They are very well connected. They are very up-to-date, but the flip side, they are very well connected. They are very up-to-date. They are busy professionals who might not be able to give students uh, as much time as full-time faculty. So is it a mix? If it is a mix, how does it work and so on? What is the student engagement? How, how are people engaging with each other? How is the program engaging with people? You need to understand that uh, pretty well. What is the student satisfaction? Do they even care about student satisfaction? Do they have any measures of student satisfaction? What is the class size? This is a big one. Again, no correct answer. Some programs will limit their classes so to make sure that the faculty can meaningfully interact with students. Other programs, you have 500, 600 students in a class and it will for all intents and purposes be MOOC. Usually, usually there is a price difference between the two. So what is important to you? Do you are you looking for more engagement or do you just need the content and be, be left alone? What is the placement record? If you are doing this for advancing of your career, have they helped other people advance their career? Be pretty much relentless uh, uh, about this, okay? What are the career services? So if you are talking to somebody that's admission rep for a, for a master's degree, you know, do they have the program specific career services or just the career center of the university? And then how is the program staying timely? All right. How do they update, uh, how, how do they update uh, the program and to make sure that they are covering topics that are relevant uh, to the industry? Again, under the assumption you are doing this for career progression. If you are talking to to the online programs in particular, then there is a different set of questions in addition to everything that we talked so far. So the first one is, are the two degrees equivalent? If they have online option and in-person option, do they somehow designate online as a separate degree? Oftentimes that is the case. Oftentimes there is a change. There is a difference in price. The problem is that degree might or might not get recognized in the marketplace. Are online courses synchronous or asynchronous? Are you expected to show up at the given time in a video conference or do you not have to? Because this could be very important depending on your work schedule. The big one is also what is the approach here in this program? Are courses built by subject matter experts, you know, as in very famous faculty, but then facilitated by somebody else. So the course was developed by Professor X who is a national authority or international authority, 
but you never see Professor X in a class. You actually deal with the facilitator. So do they have faculty model or the facilitator model? The next one is how available is the faculty to students? You know, are these just the talking heads that you see, or are these people that will answer your questions that will, you know, have regular office hours, email communication, and so on? And then finally, how are the university and program resources made available to online students? Since the pandemic, this issue has been, uh, this has been improving, but still there are differences. There are certainly some things that especially big universities have in person that are maybe not as available to people online. So how are they bridging that gap? So what's the bottom line? Number one, there is no correct answer to any of the questions that I posed, okay? So when choosing the program, choosing the format, you have to figure out what it is that you want to do and how do you wanna, if you will go about it. You should have at least a bachelor's degree and you should strongly consider master's degree. Many of the non-degree options will tell you, well, the degrees are too theoretical, we are more practical. That is not the case any longer. A lot of degrees are making sure that they actually teach skills, not just the theory, and you need to get to the bottom of it, how they are doing that, okay? Boot camps and MOOCs can be very, very, very useful uh, as long as you have what I would say, the underlying degree. So if you already have a master's, do you wanna go for second master's? Maybe yes, maybe no. If you have a PhD, do you really need to go for master's or something else? Again, maybe yes, maybe no, but MOOCs and boot camps will also get you there because you demonstrate skill and you have a degree to kind of cover you. But if you don't have a degree, especially if you don't have bachelor's, and especially if you want to have a career rather than just a job, you really need to consider getting a degree first and then worrying about the boot camps and MOOCs. All right, and then which format should you choose? You have to be honest with yourself. What works best for you? Okay, and what services do you need and are they offered online? This of course is a function of how you learn, but it's also a function of schedule and life and, and everything else, all right? And last, but actually the most important, do not hesitate to ask tough questions. When these people reach out to you via email, these people, myself included, if you ever are interested in one of our programs, be relentless. Be relentless, ask these questions, do not shy away, do not worry about offending them. If they can't answer these questions, run away. Okay, so be relentless in grilling the program staff on the programs. This is your life. This is at the end of the day, your money. Uh, make sure that you understand what you are getting yourself into. Any questions? All right, so if you do have any questions, this is my contact information, the websites for the two programs, and we do have a booth. Uh, that you can visit at the data science conference. So I do have a question, thank you for this. What is the best way to objectively verify institution's reputation? Uh, Google is, but not normally, but normal institutions try to flood the internet with most positive images of themselves, of course. O also most admins will give a rosy picture of their reputation, how best to confirm their assurances. Couple of ways. So obviously there are the rankings, uh, the US News and World Report rankings, although they might or might not be useful because they might not, uh, you know, they might or might not uh, rank particular programs. Uh, so there is one, so that's the brand name, right? Uh, US News World Report rankings will give you that. The other thing, like anything else, uh, ask people, get on the LinkedIn. You, you might have some idea what job you want to do. You might have some idea of the local area. You might have some idea of people uh, that are hiring these people. Look at which schools they went to. You know, LinkedIn can be a tool there. You can also set up some informational interviews and say, hey, I'm considering the programs. Do you know of any, uh, of any school? So you essentially have to do research. Uh, I would say if you are interested in a program, in a particular program, one of the things that you can do is you can reach out to people on LinkedIn who have finished the program. And oftentimes they will answer your questions as well and see what they have to say. Yes, uh, you know, I think I would be insulting your intelligence if I didn't say that, yes, if you talk to me, I'll tell you, obviously, BC is wonderful, right? But I always encourage people to, you know, reach out to some of our students and, you know, we can facilitate those introductions or you can reach out to them via LinkedIn or something like that, uh, you know, that, that, you, that you can uh, get the answers for yourself. Uh, the other question... Many big tech companies have their own training certification that is much quicker and they usually 
you have employed tens of thousands of graduates already, that is true. And like I said, you know, these certifications work the best when they are coupled with a degree. That's what we are seeing uh, by far for movement within the company also to go from individual contributor to management. If you don't have at least bachelors, we constantly see people hitting that wall. Uh, will that change possibly? How quickly? I, I don't know. Uh, let's see, are there bachelors online? Of course, there are bachelors, masters and PhD programs online. How do colleges, university programs justify the fact that many of the instructors have no industry experience? Uh, very carefully, <laughs> I mean, some of the instructors, uh, so many of the instructors are subject matter experts. So there is something to be said about actually learning the subject matter. You know, if you are talking about analytics, actually learning the statistics and actually learning some of the methods before getting into the project management and, or, you know, or uh, hardcore coding or, or anything like that. So number one, they are, they are the subject matter experts. The other uh, issue that you do have, especially when, you know, you have a department with a bunch of full-time faculty doing this, uh, you know, some different programs do not require industry experience, right? So if you have, people that are looking for the research oriented program, then you know the faculty that has research experience will be, will be much more uh, useful. I would say for the industry oriented programs, you do want to look at the, for the programs that have faculty with industry experience. Oftentimes the full-time faculty that might not have held full-time jobs, oftentimes they will have strong consulting experience or they might have industry experience before joining the academia. So, but again, that is one of the questions. How do colleges justify it? Colleges justified by the fact that, you know, they are not necessarily always training people for, uh, you know, for industry directly. And then it's a mix of faculty. More often than not, it's a mix of faculty. So there will be some faculty who are just academics all their life. And then there will be some faculty uh, that have, you know, industry experience and then depends who teaches what. So if I'm teaching basic statistics, I would say it's probably not as important to have industry experience as it is to be able to actually convey these, uh, uh, you know, this material to students who don't have the background. Whereas if I'm teaching, for example, in our program, we have the project management and the product management courses uh, there you know, both faculty obviously have industry experience because that is definitely very industry oriented. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't go very far. You don't go very far just talking about it. You have to explain to people how actually it works in reality. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, thank you all for stopping by. I believe we are at the time. And if you do have some questions offline, uh, this is my email address. And again, these are the websites of our two programs. So feel free to reach out and relentlessly grill me or anybody else that gets in touch with you with all the questions that I uh, told you to, to ask. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you, Vimal.